as I began to put today's message together, to be quite honest, I actually uh, struggled quite a bit because there was a number of different things I want to talk about. And, you know, I remember during Bible college, whenever I talked to our professor who was teaching us the ideas and concepts behind sermons and such, one of the things they talked about is you can either use a shotgun or a rifle. And, and the point was this, if you use a shotgun, you're kind of scattered everywhere. And if you're using a rifle, you're kind of direct and to the point. And I said, you know, there's so many things that are going on. How do I hit all of it without being a shotgun blast, but yet make one singular point like you would with, say, a rifle with one single shell? And I came to realize something. They're all really wrapped up into one singular idea, and that is this. This one singular point that I want to talk about is this, this morning. There is no place of peace with the exception of a heart where Christ is at. There is no place of peace with the exception of a heart where Christ is at. And so, as we look at the world around us, there's so many things that are wrong, so many things that we can point to and say, you know what? And on both sides, to be quite honest, you can point and say, it doesn't matter the political affiliation and all that. At the end of the day, there's so many things that are just bad. And so it's hard for us sometimes to hone in on singular ideas. And I think that was my, my primary struggle, to be honest. And so, I like that one. That one's good. <laughs> I'm going to have to get that one myself, actually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but the point is... Yeah? yeah? Oh. So, as I was saying, the, the, the struggle with putting these words together, um, it's very important, kind of... Uh, to be honest, sometimes when I struggle to put a, a message together, sometimes they actually turn out to be better messages than if I was to just write what was easy. And so I asked myself, what is it most importantly about the Scripture whenever things are times of difficulty? And I realized that as I looked into the Scripture, there is a book, and I've been preaching a lot of it out lately for some odd reason, and that's the book of Revelation. And the message of Revelation is very, very clear. No matter what bad is happening around you, in the end, good triumphs. And so that's where we're going to be at today, the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And to be honest, I probably preached on this fairly recently, I think, maybe within the last year. I, I know I've at least touched on it recently because I've been in and out of the book of Revelation quite a bit. And so the book of Revelation, chapter 21, is where we're going to be at. <clears throat> Revelation, chapter 21, starting at verse 1, and it says... <clears throat> Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. We're going to stop right there. Verse 1, there is something very important you've got to realize. Whenever it comes to things that divide people, and there's so much of that right now, verse 1 right here is very important. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. This earth is not to be saved. Period. That has been a very, very difficult thing for me to struggle because I have, for a long time, and I think I came to this realization about two, three years ago, I've always struggled and thought that if we work harder, if we pray more, if we do these things of devotion within this world that we can perhaps save this world. This world is not to be saved. This world is to be judged and recreated. And the reason why is, of course, the curse is upon this world from the very beginning within the Garden of Eden. And so this world will be remade. The purpose of our, for lack of a better word, works is to make sure that we're not a part of this world, to help us to set ourselves apart, to be consecrated away from it, to be holy. The idea of being holy isn't something that, that is necessarily attainable through just our works, but rather it is a process of becoming more and more like God. And are we to ever truly be holy like He is? No. But the word holy itself simply means to be separate. 
And so it is vital for us as Christians to recognize we are indeed separate from this world. And if you look over history, you'll see a couple things that are very, very clear. A lot of people don't realize this. But if you go back into history, you'll see something very clear. Christianity, where it comes into a nation, an area, a tribe, a people, changes those people for the better. And over time, Christianity eventually meets um, resistance from within that place. And if you look, if you go back in history, back in and around the 900 AD period, I'm going to use this as a perfect example. In the 900s, Christianity exploded into what was become today Russia. Russia had not been a Christian nation up until that time period. And I don't remember the exact year it officially became a Christian nation, but it became a Christian nation over about a 100 to 200 year period because Russia was a very, very tribal, very, very, I don't want to say backwater, but at, I mean, you're talking a thousand years ago, it was frontier. And where there were tribes of people, they didn't have a lot of contact with other tribes outside of their area on a regular basis. And so when Christianity exploded into Russia, it took hundreds of years for what we would know today as Russia to be fully Christianized. You fast forward a thousand years. A lot of people don't realize this in the West. Russia was Orthodox Christian for a very, very long time. In fact, Orthodoxy is still the primary religion in Russia. And it's still the primary religion in Greece, by the way. It's still the primary religion in Ethiopia, in, in Egypt. These Middle Eastern areas, when we're talking about Christians who are being persecuted, that is the type and form of Christianity they predominantly follow. And Russia, for let's just call it a thousand years, was predominantly Christian up until the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union came, one of the first things it did was began to try to stomp out religion and faith. There's a quote from Karl Marx, of course, who's the founder of communism. And basically, he flat out says, one of the first things you have to do to kill the trees, you have to cut the stump. And one of the things that had united the Russian people was, in fact, their faith. Here's what's interesting. Some two, three hundred years after Russia turned Christian, there was this thing that happened called the Mongol invasion. And if you ever heard of the Mongol invasion, it was not a very friendly thing. And the only thing that really stopped it, to be quite honest, was the Black Death. And a lot of people don't realize it, but it actually is a part of the cause of the Black Death. And even it could not eradicate Christianity. It could not stamp it out. So no matter how much we may think that, you know, the world has gone bad and that things are difficult against us, Imagine living, say, in 1250 A.D. in the middle of Russia where you've got these Mongol raiders who just keep coming across the countryside, destroying and pillaging, and, and just behind them comes nothing but death and plague. And they didn't give up faith. They didn't give up hope. They persevered. So no matter how bad things may look, we have to realize one thing, and that is this. Christ is on His throne. God is in His kingdom. But most importantly, this earth this earth is marked for destruction. This earth, our works, our efforts within it are for the purpose to make sure that we're not a part of this earth, but that rather we stand different from it in a way that we're trying to bring people with us. Now, does that mean that we don't discuss things like what sin is and, and what things are sin? No, because the simple truth is, if you look within the scripture, what the Scripture is guiding people for is this purpose. God says, don't sin because I am holy. And He says, I cannot have anything sinful within my presence. And so therefore, don't be sinning. Now, a lot of people think that that means, you know, you strike the sin. But it's important while striking the sin not to strike the sinner. Because here's the thing. We also want to break ourselves of sin as well. Because once a person gets an appetite for something, once they get a taste of it, it's sometimes hard to break that. I will confess to you, I have got a sweet tooth. There are some certain things that if we have, I just cannot resist myself. And I'm going to tell you, my little kids have picked up that same sweet tooth. There is this thing in our house that my wife makes that as soon as it's made, it's gone. And it's called sweet tea. And she makes it really, really good. Now, what she does, of course, is what it is. 
The thing is, is that I'm used to that flavor. I'm used to that taste. So I go to the store now or anywhere else. If I drink tea, I don't like it, but I'm used to that. And that's what sin is. Sin is kind of like that sweet tea that you begin to get used to it. And that's the way it's supposed to taste. And that's what you want. The problem is it's sin and sin is death. And so therefore, it is important and vital for all of us. If it, you are to, to wear the name Christian upon yourself, it is vital to leave sin behind. Don't get a taste for it. Don't get a flavor for it because it will destroy you. It will pull you from God. Now, does that mean that we're going to be sinless? No. We're all going to make mistakes. I am one of the chief sinners there is. I make mistakes every day. But the purpose is that we're striving to be different. We're striving to be like God. It doesn't mean we're better. It means we're just trying to be better than what we were. Never measure yourself against another. Only measure yourself against yourself. And I think that's kind of common sense in all things. We have to measure ourselves against ourselves because you can't point to someone else and say, well, I'm better than that person. Or you can't point to another person and say, well, that person really is a good godly person because they may all struggle in their own ways. We all have our own fight to fight. We all have our own lives to live. We all have faced different things. But in the end, we all must measure ourselves against ourselves. How are we running our own race? That's the best question we can ask ourselves. And you see here, Christ has got in store for us a new beginning. And he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer a sea. Verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. How amazing is that? Over my life, I have seen a lot of beautiful brides, and I tell you the truth. Every husband out there, whenever the, the bride comes down the aisle, jaws, they all drop. They're just, it's splendid to look. And, and you think about all the effort and hard work that goes into making such a beautiful experience. And the same thing is still true whenever we're looking forward into this heaven. That's the only way they can describe it to us because it's so beyond description. It's much like a, a husband receiving a new bride. And so we'll be standing there with our, our jaws dropped. And I look, I look forward to it. I really do. Verse 3 again, it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God with us. There's something very, very amazing about that very concept, that God would be with us. He shall be walking with us. He shall commune with us. And there's a connection I want to make this morning, that is to communion itself. While we partake of communion weekly here within the Christian church, not all churches do. Um, I don't know all the, some people go by a schedule, some do it monthly, some have special services. I think, um, perhaps I think the Catholics may do it every week, I'm not 100% sure. But the thing is this, whenever Christ left this world, he, world he, he left us something, he left us a gift, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And when we're to come into communion, we are to sit and we're to ponder and we're to reflect upon our own sinfulness. But more importantly, the fact that he still left himself for us. He still gave his body for us. He still gave his blood. And most importantly, in so doing, he showed us the way home by witnessing a life that is the life of Christ itself so that we can walk like him. We have got a guide. I tell you the truth, there's a lot of things in this world that I have done that I never thought I would ever do. And one of those things is... is to be quite simply and honest, I remember when I was a little kid, I used to work on cars. And as I got older, I didn't really like working on cars so much because they get tedious and sometimes you got to count on them to work and they don't. And it just, it's frustrating sometimes. I quit working on cars and I started working on computers just kind of for fun because if my computer doesn't turn on, it doesn't mean I'm late for work, <laughs> you know? But when my car doesn't turn on, yeah, I could be late for work. It's a little different that way. But the thing is, there's stuff I've done with computers that I would have never thought it was possible. How I got there, to be quite honest, I had a guide. I had a friend, I had a colleague, someone who'd done it before, show me how to do it. 
And that's what we have within the scripture. It's what we have. So search the scripture because I tell you the truth. When you search it, you're looking at a guide of how to get to where we all want to go. To that kingdom that God has in store for all of us. And he says, I will be with you. He will commune with us. Community. Communion. Those things are linked for a reason because God will truly be with every one of us. <clears throat> There's also something quite terrifying about that. There really is a God, and he really be, will be with us. And so whenever we think back over our lives and we think back over the decisions we have made for the errors that we have done, someday we will stand with God and we will commune with him, try to, try to get there as best we can. And that's something I always have to remind myself. Try to do our best. The flip side is, for those who never accepted Christ, I don't know what hell is going to be like, but it is a very, very real place. The scripture speaks of it very clearly. And what you find is this. In the book of Isaiah says that he is an all-consuming fire. What will it be like to stand before God, an all-consuming fire, without having received him, knowing full well there is now a God? I don't know. I don't want to imagine it. I only want to imagine the other side of the fence, and that is to welcome and be a part of this kingdom. Verse 4 says, <clears throat> And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Amen. The old order has passed away. This old way of being, the struggles and all the strife that you see around us is going to end. Thank God. I tell you the truth, thank God. Because I tell you, oh, this is a clown world that we live in. And I can only take so many little honking horns from clowns for so long. And it's one of those things I look upon these words and I realize that someday this is all going to stop. And we're all going to come home. And we're all going to be one great family once more there within the presence of not just our King, but our Savior, the one who laid his life down for us. The one who will be with us for all of our days. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. <clears throat> if I were to try to picture heaven, those are the words I would start with. No pain, no suffering, no death, no mourning, no crying. No sadness, no strife, none of these things that we see here every day. That's how I would describe heaven. And that's the goal we all want to get to. The challenge I want to lay before you is this. Make sure that you're walking this direction as best you can. Many years ago, I heard this story, and I don't know if it was a song or what it was, but there was a congregation one day, and they were having a revival meeting. And the pastor he began to ask for testimonies and such, and different people. There was a guy in the audience, he was a car salesman. He stood up and said, you know, I'm going to get to heaven riding in one of those great Buicks I sell down at work. Another fellow was an airplane pilot, so he stood up and he said, I'm going to come to heaven, I'm going to come on a great airplane. And, of course, another man, he worked in the Navy, and he had said, I was going to come there on a great ship. And a little old lady in the back stood up and said, I'm going to make it, and I can only make it about half a mile a day. That's about as far as I can walk a day. I'm going to tell you the truth. If you can only come half a mile a day, do it. If you can come in a great ship or an ocean liner, do it. However you've got to do it, do it. And invite friends on the way. So I tell you the truth. Not everyone's going to hear the message. Not everybody's going to want to accept the message. The message is out there if they're willing to look. But a lot of people, we've seen real quick, a lot of people don't, you could have the message right in front of them. You're going to miss it. Try to bring as many people with you. We're not all going to get there at the same speed. But we all have the same goal in mind. And our goal and our hope for every one of us is we all get there someday. So in conclusion, as we go throughout this week, the book of Revelation, I know a lot of people look at it and they talk about these ideas of prophecy and what's yet to come. It's actually a book of hope. Whenever you read the words, you realize that all these people saw terrible things taking place but in the end, what was their goal? Their goal is the same goal that we have today. And that is hope itself. So each and every one of you, as you go throughout this week, don't be afraid to pick up this book, to look through it, to read it. But recognize one most important thing about it. Its goal is very simple. To get to that place of peace 
and that place of peace is with Christ himself. 